All right, so in this class, we're going to start discussing bonds. We'll start off with a bond issued for par um, with a coupon. And we'll just talk about how the purchasers of the, of the bonds are treated when you, they buy bonds with a coupon. <coughs> oh, excuse me. Um, then we'll talk about bonds that are issued with a discount. So these are bonds that have original issued discount. And we'll talk about how um, purchasers of those bonds and buyers of those bonds are treated. So without any further ado, let's start doing that. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't share my screen. Um, so let's share the screen, pull up the PowerPoint. And there you go. So let's start with regular debt. So when we have regular debt, um, let's say I have a $10,000 bond that I'm issuing. So when I'm issuing the bond, I'm borrowing money. I'm receiving $10,000 today. I tell you I'm going to pay you back $10,000 in the future, and I'm going to pay you interest for lending me the money. Um, just to make the numbers simple, I'm going to either use 12% interest or 6% interest. And I realize that does not reflect current interest rates. It's just that it makes the math so much easier. Um, and it's the concept that I want to teach. So let's go to the whiteboard and I'll do an example. And that I think, again, that'll be the best way to teach this. And out of the way. Okay, so we have a ten thousand dollar bond, and it has twelve percent, twelve percent coupon, well, twelve percent interest, and the interest is an annual interest rate. And there are two coupons paid during the year. So they're paid semi-annually. So the bond, let's say, is issued on 3-1-2021. Um, it's going to mature on 2-28. Two thousand thirty-one. It's a ten-year bond, and it has a twelve percent coupon, as we've already said. And I want to buy this bond, and it's already trading in the marketplace. And I'm going to buy the bond on five one twenty twenty-one, and I'm going to pay ten thousand. $150 for the bond. And when I pay the $10,150, that's just the, that's the price I'm going to pay. And the question is, how much am I paying for the bond? And how much is being paid for the coupon? And for tax purposes, I have to break that out. Well, interest accrues on a daily basis. So the bond was issued on March 1st and it's paying a 12% coupon. So 12% on $10,000 is 1,200 in a year, 12 months in a year. So interest is accruing at $100 a month. So we've got March 1st to April 1st is one month, and then April 1st to May 1st is two months. And I'm gonna be counting on my fingers a lot um, for the remainder of this class. Um, and when we get to OID, it becomes very important. So get used to doing that. Um, so how much is being paid for the coupon? $200 is being paid for the coupon. So 
So how much is being paid for the bond? Um, Nine thousand nine hundred and fifty dollars is being paid for the bond. Now, in the next class, we'll talk about a crude market discount. We'll see that this bond has um, market discount, but right now, let's just forget about that. So, what's going to happen? What's going to happen is on March first or on August thirty first. You know what? On August thirty. On August 31st, 2021, I'm going to receive the coupon. And how much am I gonna, going to receive? I'm going to receive $600. Don't even spend $600. And the question is, how much income do I have? Well, I paid 200 for the coupon, now receiving 600, I'm gonna have $400 of income with respect to the first coupon. And if I'm a cash basis taxpayer, I'm not going to receive any more coupons in 2021. Um, and since I'm not gonna receive any more coupons in 2021, I'm going to have no more income to recognize with respect to this bond. And so I'm going to have um, a total of $400 of interest income, $400 interest income, if I'm a cash basis taxpayer. All right, and then next year, so I'm sorry, I have to continue this up here. Next year on, September, October, November, December, on February 28th of 2022, I'll receive another $600 um, of coupon payment. And I will have $600 of income. So when you're a cash basis taxpayer, you just follow the cash. And now let's assume that I sell the bond on 5122 on let's make it 6122 and I sell the bond for $10,200. That's my sales price. Now if you just looked at the purchase price and said, oh, the purchase price was 10,150 and the sales price is 10,200, you would say, oh, we have $50 of income. But that's not what's happening at all. Remember when we bought the bond, we had um, a purchase price of the bond of $9,950. That's my basis in the bond. So now when I sell it, what's my amount realized? Well, when I sell it, I'm selling a coupon and the last time that the coupon paid interest was on February 28th. We've got March, April, and May. I've got three months have gone by. I'm selling the coupon for $300. And that's going to be interest income. And then what am I selling the bond for? I'm selling the bond for $9,900. That's my amount realized. What was my basis? Oh, let's do this one. My basis was 99.50. So but I will actually have a loss of $50 on the sale of the bond. And then to recap, for a cash basis taxpayer, we had 2021 interest income, $400. 2022, 
we have interest income. Um, we had $600 from the coupon, $300 when we sold the bond, that's $900, right? So that's 600 plus 300. And then we have a loss on the bond. Uh, minus 50. And so our total taxable income from the bond equals $1,250. All right, we have $1,300 of interest income. We have a $50 loss. It nets out to $1,250. Now let's assume that I'm an accrual basis taxpayer. An accrual ta basis taxpayer doesn't care about cash, we care about economics. So in 2021, how many months did they hold the bond for? They bought the bond on May 1st. So they've held the bond for eight months. Again, it's May, June, July, August, September, October, November, December, eight months. They've got $800 of interest income. And for 2022, they held the bond for five months. They sold it on six one. So they've got 500 of interest income. And they also have um, a loss. They have the same loss. They're gonna compute their basis the same way. And they're gonna have a $50 loss on the sale. And so the total is $1,250 net income. So as you can see, it doesn't matter what method of accounting I use, the total taxable income has to be the same. What's, what's different is the amount of income and loss that I'm picking up each year. So the accrual basis taxpayer picks up, 20, picks up $800 of interest income in 2021. The cash basis taxpayer only picked up $400 of interest income in 2021. So it's 800 versus 400. And then in 2022, they've got 500 of interest income and they ended up with 900 of interest income. So the amounts are different each year when I go from cash to accrual, or they could be different each year from cash to accrual, but in total, they have to be the same. And the gain or loss on the bond will always be the same. So this is how we treat bonds with, right, with coupons um, and how we pick up the interest income. The interest income accrues really on a daily basis. Um, to make it simple, I'm gonna use a monthly basis. Uh, we could break it out by days, but you don't have to get that um, precise. So just do it by months. Look at the coupon. Look at the annual interest rate. Know that there are always two coupons. Um, the coupon is always half that amount. And accrue the income on a monthly basis. And that's the way you would then allocate your purchase price between the bond and the coupon. And then when you sell the bond, you have to accrue, you have to, um, break out the price between the coupon and the bond as well. All right, so that's, well, I think that's relatively straightforward. And in your homework questions, I'll have a question that covers all of this. All right, so let's go back to the PowerPoint. And as I said, so this is normal debt. And the only thing that's different with cash and accrual is the timing of the income. The total amount of income has to be the same. We're not changing economics. The only thing that um, the method of accounting does is change the timing of the income. Now, when we have income on a debt, it's hard to get capital gains on debt. Um, and why is it? Because a lot of the discount, a lot of times when we buy a bond at a discount, where it's trading for less than the amount that it's going to be redeemed for, 
that difference is going to end up being picked up as interest income or ordinary income. It's rarely going to be capital gain. The time that you will get capital gain is if interest rates move while you're holding the bond and they move in your favor. Um, that would be the way that you would, you would get capital gain. So let's go through the rules now with respect to discount. So there's something called original issue discount. Original issue discount is when a bond is originally issued with a discount. So, so uh, I apologize for using the same words. So I'm going to issue a bond that's going to come due for $10,000 um, 10 years from now. And I'm going to issue it today for $9,000. So I'm only going to receive $9,000 today. I'm going to pay you $10,000 10 years from now. But guess what? I'm not going to make any coupon payments on this bond. It's going to be a zero coupon bond. And for our class, anytime that we're going to deal with a bond with original issue discount, I'm going to have it be a zero coupon bond. Um, it just gets, it's just a little more complicated to deal with the math if we put in a coupon. So I'm just going to make it zero coupon. So what's the rule? The rule is that the holder of any debt instrument having original issue discount shall include an income to some of the daily portions of the original issue discount for each day in the year that they held the bond. So on, when we do original issue discount, we are going to have to, we are going to, have to count days. Um, and days are going to, so it's just going to make the, the computation a little more tedious. Um, anytime that you include um, income, um, on the discount, you increase your basis in the bond, so you don't have to pay tax twice. Okay. Um, and what is original issue discount? It's the excess of the stated redemption price at maturity over the issue price. What's the stated redemption price at maturity? The amount that the bond is going to be paid off for at the end, when it matures, when it comes due. So in my example, I'm issuing the bond today for 9000 I'm going to pay it off for 10,000 10 years from now. The stated uh, redemption price is $10,000. What's the issue price? The issue price is what was it originally issued for? In my example, I'm just telling you it's 9,000. So the original issue discount is the excess. It's the 10,000 over the 9,000, which is 1,000. And that's gonna be the total original issue discount. And that amount of income has to be picked up on a daily basis over the 10 year period. Now in determining the issue price, if it's publicly offered, then it's the price at which most of the bonds were sold for on the offering day. If it's non-publicly offered, then you look at the first price that was paid for the bond. All right, so let's go through an example. Um, oh, I'm sorry, before we get to an example, if I have a debt issue for property, if the property is publicly traded, then the issue price is equal to the fair market value of the property. So I issue you a bond, you give me shares of stock, shares of Apple. Um, I can value the shares of Apple. So whatever the value is, that's the amount that I issued that for. So if you give me $9,000 worth of Apple stock, the issue price is $9,000, the redemption price is 10,000, there's going to be $1,000 of original issue discount. If you give me property that's not publicly traded, um, you give me shares of your privately held company, um, then the issue price is going to be equal to the redemption price. So that if um, the redemption price is 10,000 in that example, and you give me some property, we have no idea what the value is. We're just going to say the issue price is 10,000, the redemption price is 10,000. Um, there is no original issue discount. You don't have to pick up any income and I don't have to pick up, I don't get any deductions. So I haven't talked about that yet, but I'm, then we have to get into what do we do with all this discount? Um, again, we're going to allocate everything on a daily basis. So we allocate to each day in any accrual period and the accrual period, by the way, is a six month period. Um, and whatever we increase the, um, the, uh, to the extent that we pick up income on a daily basis, we increase the issue price and that becomes its new adjusted issue price. And how do we determine our daily portions? 
we take the adjusted issue price at the beginning of the accrual period, you multiply that by the yield to maturity, and then we subtract the amounts payable as interest during the accrual period. And in our case, three little y is always gonna be zero. And I'm gonna go through an example because right now I'm giving you words and it's very hard to follow these rules just by looking at words, just like everything else we've been doing in this course. So I will give an example. Um, the adjusted issue price again is the sum of the issue price. We start with the issue price. And as we're making adjustments for all the income during the life of the bond, we keep adding all of those adjustments to come up with the new issue price. Um, the accrual period, whenever we come, we're going to be compounding interest, we're always going to use a six month period. Um, and it corresponds, you work your way backwards instead of forwards. So in your first accrual period, you actually can have a short accrual, um, accrual period. Um, in our example, I'm always going to have the issue date and the maturity date being years. I'm not going to have them. I'm not going to have a February 1st issue date and a September 30th redemption date. If I have a February 1st issue date, I'll have a January 31st uh, redemption date. Okay, so let's do this example. Um, and, <clears throat> and this will take us, this will show us how to compute everything um, and how to apply all these rules. So Corpex issues a bond on March 1st, 2020, which will mature on March 1st, 2030. Uh, right, so it's 10 years. Uh, the bond does not have a coupon, zero coupon. It will pay $10,000 to the holder of the bond on March 1st, 2030. And it was offered to the public and a substantial was sold for 9,000. Uh, and a substantial amount was sold for 9,000. The first purchase, however, was 9,100. So these are the facts. And now the question is, what was the issue price? Well, the issue price is, um, was this bond sold to the public? And if the answer is yes, then what was the substantial amount of the bond sold for? And a substantial amount of the bond was sold for $9,000. I don't care what the first purchase was. If this was non-publicly traded um, bond, then we would go by the first purchase price. Because it is publicly traded, we look at what the substantial amount was sold for, it's $9,000. So the issue price in this example is $9,000. What is the stated redemption price at maturity? $10,000. That's what we're going to pay when the bond matures on March 1st, 2030. Um, what is the accrual period? Because it matures on March 1st, we work backwards from March 1st. Um, so it's August 31st, right? So March 1st to September 1st, the six months. The accrual period would be March 1st to August 31st. Um, how would we determine the adjusted issue price as of September 1st, 2020? So now we're gonna have to start doing some math. Um, and it's not rocket science math, but it is math. Now, when, we when I give you a problem with an original issue, with an OID bond, I will tell you what the yield to maturity is. You're not gonna have to figure out the yield to maturity. Right? You don't have to take out um, your Excel programs or your scientific calculators to figure it out. I'm going to tell you what it is. So in this example, the bond was issued on 3-1-2020, and it was issued for $9,000. It's going to mature on 3-1-2030. And it's going to mature for $10,000. So we know we have $1,000 of OID on the bond. And it's not going to be exact, but for our purposes, it's going to be close enough. I'm going to tell you that the yield to maturity on this bond on an annual basis is 1%. Right? Because $1,000, uh, we're going to have $1,000 of interest on a $9,000 investment, and it's going to compound semi annually. Um, and so over 10 years, it, it'll be close. And it'll be close. So on March 1st, 2020, it's got an, an issue price of 
we then say, what's the accrual period? The accrual period is six months. So we can either do 831 20, 20, or 9 1 20, 20. You know, I'm not going to go crazy over one day. So for, the, so for six months, it's going to accrue at 0.005%, right? Because 1% would be how much it's accruing for in a year. So in a six month period, it's accruing interest at a half of 1%, 50 basis points. So the interest for this period is $45. It's just simply 9,000 times one half of 1%. And so on 9-1, my adjusted issue price is now $9,045. So it's that simple or that difficult, however you like your math. So let's go back quickly. Let's go back to the problem. And then we'll come back to the whiteboard and finish up the problem. So now the question is, how would I determine the amount of income a holder would include in 2020? Um, cash versus accrual, does it matter? And the answer is no, it does not matter. Everyone must use this method of accounting. We don't care if you're a cash basis taxpayer. We don't care if you're an accrual basis taxpayer. You must, must use this method of accounting. Um, and cash basis taxpayers hate original issue discount bonds just for that reason. They say, oh, I've got to include all this income and I'm not getting paid anything. This is phantom income. Um, and you'll hear people refer to original issue discount bonds as throwing off phantom income. And that's the reason that they say that. All right, so these rules apply whether you're a cash basis taxpayer or whether you're an accrual basis taxpayer. Now, what's interesting with original issue discount bonds, the holders are accruing income and they're picking up income and paying tax on it. The issuer gets to deduct the interest. So it sounds like there's symmetry. The recipients are picking up income. The buyers of the bonds are picking up income. They have to include it. The issuers have, get to be able to deduct it. But what ends up happening in the real world is that a lot of the buyers of these bonds are tax exempt. They're endowment funds of colleges, they're charities, and they just have to invest money. And they like this kind of investment because they can invest money for a, a longer period of time and have a fixed rate of interest. They know what they're earning. So what ends up happening is the tax exempt investors aren't paying any tax because they're tax exempt and the issuers are getting interest expense deductions. So it looks like where there's symmetry, in real life, there really isn't symmetry and the government ends up coming up a little short. Um, so I've just went to a slight aside here, just going over that the rules are the same for cash versus accrual. Remember that as we're picking up the interest income, the issuer is getting an interest expense deduction. But now let's go back to the problem. So we know through August 31st, we picked up $45 of income. Now we're gonna to have to pick up income for the remainder of the year. Um, and this is where you're gonna to have to start counting on your fingers. You're gonna to have to start doing other math along with it. Um, and that's because we're gonna to have to do something on a daily basis. And so let's continue with the problem. The next accrual period, is going to be from September 1st. Let me just make this bigger. At least I have some room to work with. So the next accrual period is going to be from 9 1 2020 through 228 2021. And in the next accrual period, my adjusted issue price is now 9,045. I still, my interest is still 0 0.005, but now my interest income is 9045 times 0.005. And that equals $45.22. 
as you can see, with because we're compounding the interest, the amounts keep getting larger and larger. Um, now, in this example, it's not that much more. But we have $45.22 of income, but that's from 9.1 to 2.28. I have to know how much do I pick up between 9.1 through 12.31, 2020. So the way you do that is you count, is we count the number of days in this period. So September has 30 days, October has 31 days, November has 30 days and December has 31 days. So in this period, we've got 122 days. And by the way, every six month period has a different number of days. So you, or, so you can't just say, oh, six months is half a year. So some will be 182 and some will be 183. It's not gonna work that way. Um, and especially when February is involved in the period. Um, now I purposely picked 2021 as the year that we're gonna count the February in um, because I just didn't wanna deal with a leap year. So I know 2021 is not a leap year. But again, so we wanna know how many days are there in the total period. Well, again, we've got September, October, November. November, December, January and February. And so how many days is this? Um, 59, 90, 120 and 61 is 181. So there are 181 days in the entire six month period. There are 122 days in the period between September 1st to 1230. So I take 122, I divide that by 181 and I multiply that by 45.22 and that equals 1.5 $30.48. So the amount of income for the year, $30.48 plus 45 equals 75.48. And my basis in the bond at the end of the year is, so basis as of 1231 is 9,075.40. And if I sold the bond on December 31st, that would be my basis. So I'm just gonna have to put this up here. Let's assume that I sell the bond on 1231 for $1,000 or $9,100. I would have an amount realized of $9,100. I would have basis. Let me fix this. Well, my basis is 9075.4, and I would end up with a capital gain of $24.60. And even though I, so I know I said that it's hard to get capital gains, what this means is that interest rates must have declined from the time that the bond was issued to the time I sold it, and that's why I was able to get a higher amount. Right, but this is the way you would do it. So you would, you would take the yield to maturity, which I'm going to give you, that's gonna be an annual yield, cut it in half because you're going to accrue the interest on a six month basis. You're going to do the computation for the first six months, pick up the income 
Um, then you're gonna, and you're gonna do that for every six month period. Now, where you're gonna have a problem is when your year round is in the middle of one of these six month periods, and then you're gonna have to break out the six month income to the two pieces um, and do that on a daily basis. Or if you sell the bond, because let's, let's assume I, in this case, I sold the bond on 1231. I have to know what my basis is. The way I figure out my basis by when I sell the bond for 1231 is I have to do this computation. What would it, what, how much would the interest income have been had I held it for six months? How much then do I accrue from the last time that we adjusted it to the time I sold it? And that becomes the amount of interest income in that short period. Pick that up as interest income, add it to my basis, compare that to the, my amount realized. And there you go, you have a capital gain or you have a capital loss. If I had sold the bond for 9,070, so that would be my amount realized. My basis is 9,075.40. So that's my basis. I would actually have a loss of $5.40. And that's, a that's really a bad result because that loss is a capital loss. And if I don't have capital gains, I can't deduct that loss. But I had to accrue all the interest income regardless. And, I'm, and I picked that up as ordinary income. So I had to pick up that last um, $30.48 Um, of interest income. So I guess my basis, I keep using 40, and I guess the basis really is 48. Um, so the capital gain is really 52 cents. All right, I, I can't fix it, but it's close enough. All right, I left out the, um, the last eight cents. But that's fine. Um, but that's the concept. So hopefully when you do it, you won't leave out the last day set. All right, so that's how we compute OID. That's the way we would then figure out our basis. And we just keep doing this on and on until the bond matures. By the way, the adjusted issue price never changes, doesn't change based on your, based on the taxpayer. So that the adjusted issue price is computed for the life of the bond. And I don't change it for each individual taxpayer depending on what they bought the bond for. We'll make other adjustments because of that. Um, they'll, a subsequent purchaser might have the bond that they purchased at a premium. They might buy the bond at a market discount, and then we'll take that into account. But the adjusted issue price never changes. It's based on the original issue price. And the original yield to maturity. It will never change. Once the bond is issued, that's it. I know the amount of OID for every accrual period going forward until the bond matures. It has, we don't care about any subsequent purchases. Um, as I said, we'll, when we go over market discount, I'll give an example where a bond will have both original issue discount and market discount, and we'll see how we deal with that. And it gets, a, you know, it just gets a little more complicated, but um, it's just following the rules. Um, and it's not that terrible to do. All right, so once the bond is issued, we know what the um, amount of income that's gonna be picked up in every accrual period until it matures. And there's actually a publication, um, a public, and the publication is publication 1212. You can Google that. And that will list every bond that has issued at original issue discount it will tell you what every bond yield to maturity is. Um, and then you can always figure out what you are, um, and it'll give you the adjusted issue price um, after any cool period. So you can see when you bought the bond, what the yield to maturity is, and you can figure out 
what your OIG is um, going forward. Um, and, it, and it will actually tell you what the OID is per thousand dollars of face of a buck, right? Um, but they need someone to figure it out and you have to know how to figure it out. And this is the way that you figure it out. So we've gone over um, regular bonds. We've gone over original issue discount bonds. Um, let's continue on now. Um, are there exceptions to the rule? There are exceptions. Tax exempt bonds, there's no such thing as original issue discount. US savings bonds, we want to encourage people to buy US savings bonds. And so we say, even though they're issued at a discount, you don't have to accrue the income. When you redeem the bond at maturity, that's when you'll pick up the income. So individuals will buy US savings bonds. Um, and a lot of times when a baby, and when there's a new baby born, you buy the baby a present and you buy them a US savings bond. Um, and it might mature in 20 years when they're ready to go to college. Um, and they don't have to pick up any of the income until they're 20 years old, but they don't have to accrue the income um, as they're holding the bond. And then we're gonna go over short-term obligations um, later on um, in the next class. Um, and they'll have their own set of rules. But if you have a bond that is issued with a maturity of one year or less, the OID rules don't apply. We have a different set of rules called acquisition discount that applies. But the bond itself has to be issued with maturity of one year or less. It's not a bond that was issued 10 years ago and now you're buying it when it only has a half year to maturity. That bond will have original issue discount and it will be subject to the original issue discount rule. Okay, now we go to what happens if I have debt issued for property? And the question is, um, is there enough um, stated interest? If there is no, not enough stated interest, we're going to, um, or let me put it the other way. If there is enough stated interest, whatever the issue price is, that's what we're gonna deem to be the issue price. If there's not enough stated interest, we're going to impute an, an issue price. Um, and how do we impute the issue price or the principal amount? We're gonna take the sum of the present value of all the payments due under the instrument. And, th and the way we're gonna compute the present value is we're gonna discount all the future payments back to the present by using the applicable federal rate that's compounded semi-annually. So I'm gonna tell you what the applicable federal rate is if I were to ask you a question on this. I don't think I'm gonna ask any questions on this, but um, if I do, be prepared to answer it. Uh, more than likely I'm not, but because I, I, this is gonna show you how complicated the math can start getting, um, but this is something that you have to know how to do. And it's really not that complicated, especially if you use a computer or a calculator. Um, so here's an example from the regulations. That's why I didn't change the years. Um, and you can find this in the regulations. Um, January 1st, 1995, A sells non-publicly traded property to B for a stated purchase price of three and a half million dollars. In consideration for the sale, B makes a down payment of 500,000 and issues a 10 year debt instrument with a stated principal of 3 million payable at maturity. Um, the debt calls for no interest for the first two years and interest at a rate of 15% payable annually over the remaining eight years of the debt instrument. And the first interest payment of $450,000, which is 15% of 3 million, is due on December 31st, 1997. So again, everything's gonna start two years from now. And the last interest payment is due on December 31st, 2004, together with the $3 million of principal. And we're going to assume that the test rate of interest applicable to the um, that instrument is 10.5%. Now, why are we interested in this? We're interested in this because A is saying that they're selling their property for $3.5 million. And they're going to compute their gain or loss based on a $3.5 million amount realized. Um, they can fool around with that number by changing the interest rates and the, changing the interest amount that's going to be payable. So if they really download, make those numbers really small, 
let's assume they said you only have to pay 1% interest for the next 10 years, then they would make the principal amount 4 million or four and a half million. And they would say, oh, that's all additional capital gain. And the government would say, no, it's not. The applicable interest rate that you should be using is 10 and a half percent. And if you're not using 10 and a half percent, you're trying to convert what would otherwise be interest income into long-term capital gain. And we're not gonna let you do that. So that's the whole purpose of using these rules making sure that the amount that you say you're getting uh, when you issue the debt is really um, an adequate amount, that it really reflects current interest rates. And back when, then when this example was written, 10.5% was the rate. So now how do we do this math? So we have to compute the imputed principal amount. The imputed principal amount is the issue price. Um, and if our imputed principal amount is greater than the issue price that the parties set, then we're going to go with the party's issue price. If it's less than the issue price that the parties set, we're going to use this as our issue price. We're not going to let um, the parties um, try to increase the amount of capital gain. So how do we do this? The first thing we do is we say, you know, $3 million is going to be paid back to us in 10 years. So what's the present value of a payment of $3 million 10 years from now? And the way you do that, um, so the answer is 1,105,346.59. And how do you do that? You take 3 million, you divide that um, by 1.105, 1.105, 1 1.10.5%. Um, and you raise that to the 10th power. And when you do that math, that will come out to 1,105,346.59. There are tables you could look at. What's the present value of a dollar 10 years from now? Um, and it'll come up with a fraction. You multiply that fraction by the total amount uh, of principal payment due. And either way, it's going to get you to 1,105,346. Then we have to say, well, what's the present value of the eight interest payments of $450,000 per year? And the way you do that is you take $450,000, divide that by 1.105. So that's discounting it for one year. Then you would do it again and discount it. Now for, two, for the second payment, you're going to discount it by two years because you want to bring it back to two years from now when the payments are going to begin. And we do that for eight years. And that's going to come out to 2,357,634. But the problem is we're not getting that money for two years. So now we have to discount that amount back two years um, to get it back to today's value. And the present value of that is 1,930,865. So the present value of all the coupon payments that are gonna go on for eight years, but they're not beginning until two years from now, when we discount that whole stream of um, payments back at 10 and a half percent, we end up with 1,930,000. We then add the 1,930,865 with the 1 million 105,346, because that, we, remember, we are getting 3 million 10 years from now as well. When we add all that together, the present value of everything comes out to 3,036,211. Since 3,036,211 is greater than 3 million, we will go with the $3 million issue price. And so if, so this taxpayer who sold the property for $3,500,000, A, can treat the $3,500,000 as the amount realized. Um, they're going to have a capital gain or loss based on the $3.5 million. The issue price is going to be $3 million. And then they're going to have to compute the income each year discounting the 3 million um, at, the yield to at the actual yield to maturity on this debt obligation. And what's going to end up happening is they're gonna have um, income in years 
one and two, um, and then they'll have income in years three through 10, but the income in years three through 10 um, isn't gonna have any relationship to the cash that they're actually receiving. So they're gonna be receiving $450,000, but they're gonna have income that's based on a different amount, that whatever the um, yield to maturity is on this debt is the amount of interest income that they're gonna have um, for each year in the following years two through 10, or years three through 10. And then finally, all the definitions. So this is another weird way that the code is written. We, we're dealing with section 1271, 1272, 1273, 1274, and yet all the definitions are in section 1275. Um, so these, to me, these are hard code sections to read, that you have to read five code sections before you get to find out what you're even talking about in the first code section. And, and, and here the definitions aren't that, um, they're not so strange that you wouldn't know what they were anyway, but a debt is defined as a bond, a debenture, just an other evidence of indebtedness. The issue date is when was the when was the bond first issued to the public, and if not public, then when was it first sold? And then there are rules saying that tax exempt obligations aren't subject to these rules, and they just say that a tax exempt obligation is um, an obligation on which the interest is not includable in income under Section 103. So you have to go back and look at Section 103. But basically, a tax exempt obligation would be an obligation issued by a state, a city a municipality, a county, but a government agency other than the US government, All right? So that wraps up um, bonds that are not issued with a discount, that just have a coupon. How do we um, allocate our purchase price when we buy one of these bonds between the coupon and the corpus and the bond? How do we account for the income depending on whether we're a cash basis or a cool basis taxpayer? And then finally, remember, cash and accrual basis of accounting only changes timing. It doesn't change total amounts. So if, when I give you a problem on this, make sure your total amounts equal, whether it's cash or accrual. And then I'll give an example of original issue discount and ask you to do the computations for two, two periods, um, three periods at the most. Um, and you would just do what we just did in this class session Remember that we compound on a semi-annual basis. If we ever have to figure out what our interest is for a portion of a period, we find out how much is the interest for the entire period, figure out the total number of days in the period, compare that to the total number of days in our smaller period, and take the fraction, the smaller number divided by the bigger number, multiplied by the total amount of interest income for that period, and that will give us the interest income allocable to the short period. All right, so in the next class, we'll cover market discount and market premium bonds.